Good morning. Um, we are going to have another one of our uh, testify. I've asked uh, Matthew Oliver if he would come forward and, and share his testimony with us. Uh, just to, to remind you, this is to be an encouragement to you. Um, you know, we, we sit here with each other week in and week out, but oftentimes we don't get that really in-depth relationship that God calls us for, appointing me a fellowship. And so part of why I want to do this is because you can start to see how each of us was at different points, but we were all in the pit. And God, through His grace and His mercy, reached down and He pulled us out. You know, your, your part of the pit may have looked very different from mine, but we were still in the pit. And so, um, Matthew, if you would come up and share what God's laid in your heart. Well, one of the things I had the opportunity to do is listen to many of you uh, go first which has brought up a lot of questions for me as to how how much of myself I wanted to share. Um, probably some of you caught on to the idea I don't care to do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I was born young, so I guess we'll start there. <laughs> I was actually born in Michigan on a family farm, um, kind of what you put on a calendar, it had the red barn, the two silos. Uh, you know, I love that place. I wanted to go back there all the way up till I was out of high school. But you get out of high school and you realize that money matters and you just don't get to do what you want to do in life. So. But anyway, I've always gone to church. Um, my parents were both professing believers. They always took me to church. Uh, at the time, I was, I, I don't know exactly how old I was. I tried to pin this down, and I know a lot of people feel that you should have this pinned down. I'm going to say it was probably about 1976. We were going to a little country church, and they had vacation Bible school. And, well, excuse me, prior to that, I want to say, um, I didn't know either one of my grandfathers, and I just share that with you guys because I'm starting to realize um, it's not really like a hole in my life, but I realize how precious the grandfathers in this room are. So I don't know my grandfathers. I knew my dad's mom briefly. I don't have a real personality to put with her. She died when I was quite young, and I really remember more of the things around her death and funeral than I remember of her. So a couple of years later, I'm in vacation Bible school. And this was obviously all orchestrated, but one of the teachers basically shared the gospel with us, shared a lot was on those tracks that we handed out Thursday. And I came to the realization that I wasn't going to go to heaven. I'd been going to church, and I knew some things by that point, but I was guilty of sin. And that was going to separate me from God. <clears throat> I don't know if it was that day or the next day, but the pastor of the church had all of us together and basically did an altar call. And I knew I wanted to be saved. The thing was that I didn't go forward that day. And this marks one aspect of my life that I think pretty much has run throughout my life. I really had questions about the sincerity of the actions of all the other kids who had spent the whole week, you know, getting themselves noticed, <coughs> excuse me, drawing attention to themselves. And they are the ones going forward, which is, which is always what happens. I'm sure everyone's been to high school and you know that's what happens. I didn't want that. I wanted it to be sincere. I knew I wanted this to be sincere. I kind of don't know what God's opinion of that moment is because I didn't go forward. And I do know that there's a degree to which if we're embarrassed of him, you know, in front of others, 
He's not going to confess us to the Father. So, whether he's happy with me or not there, I don't know. But I really question the motives of a lot of the kids. I bet if we looked them up now, they'd fit right into statistical categories, probably. But I knew from that day forward that I wanted to be saved. Very shortly after that, I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Um, but this, this is a second part that's kind of a vein in my life. I did it alone, you know, in my bedroom, in the little farmhouse. Um, I was really touched by Thaddeus' testimony because he said something that used to be true of me, and that was after he got saved. He went around the playground witnessing the people. And, you know, shy little loner Matthew used to do that too. Mm -hmm. um, and high school came, and I quit doing that. <laughs> uh, we moved here in 1978. My dad sold the farm. We moved here. The first church we went to was the Baptist church right over here. Um, you know, their present turmoil is consistent with their past. But the first pastor that was there was actually Rex Appleberry. Uh, I assume whatever was in motion was already going on. He wasn't there too long. I was young. I didn't know about church politics. You know, I just thought church was ran by a bunch of angry old men. <laughs> Another pastor that needs, I don't know if there was a separation there or not. I can't remember anybody in between them, but a man named Malcolm Woodard was a pastor there for a while. I haven't met him since the early 90s. I don't know where he's at. I know Kelly bumped into him not too many years before Kelly left, so perhaps he's still around. Um, but with whatever he was teaching and what was going on in Sunday school at the time, I came under the conviction that I wanted to be baptized. And so I was actually baptized over at that church. And that's a symbol of my faith that I still uh, openly confess and agree with. Uh, so, unfortunately, things were not well there. We eventually left. Um, oh, I would like to share that some of the first people we met when we moved here were Ted and Mary Lou Nelson. <laughs> and our families have been friendly ever since. So, um, we went to what is now the Community Baptist Church, but it was an evangelical free church at the time in that building. Um, you know, I was in my early teen years at that time, um, really trying to see what was real about church. And boy, that place was a troubled place too. Um, you know, one story I'll tell from there was we had a man that Apparently had gotten in some trouble at work. The church leadership went to investigate. Well, he stood up in the middle of the church and challenged one of the elders to a fist fight on the sidewalk <laughs> to settle the issue. So, you know, those are my teen years. But <clears throat> what happened to me through some of that was I never abandoned Jesus. Uh, we hear that excuse a lot, but the problem is I wasn't a disciple of the angry elder or the man that may or may not have stole something at work. I was a disciple of Jesus. It did cause me some problems, though, because I wasn't sure I was fellowshipping with other people that were disciples of Jesus or exactly what was going on. Also, in high school, I really became very withdrawn. I didn't do a lot of bad stuff, um, but that's the age where people start doing stuff. You know, sex, drugs, beer, booze, kids coming back from lunch break drunk. It was more drinking in school at my, in my generation than drugs, but there were some drugs. I revered God enough that I wasn't going to do that, but I also stopped witnessing and stopped really trying to get other people to stop doing it too. So I just, I became very withdrawn. 
I have absolutely no high school stories of a carload of buddies and me doing something because I didn't do any of that. I'm just alone all the time. The Evangelical Free Church blew up and actually shut the place down, I believe. That's why it's now a Baptist church. We came over here and I really liked Jesus Community Church. But I wasn't going to really get attached to anybody for a while because I just didn't trust it. You know, I didn't trust that it stayed together. And we're, we're all sinful and there are always going to be just plain people that don't believe in Jesus that go to church for whatever their motivation is. But I um, also kind of never was in an age group with anybody. So, you know, I was a high school student out in that room in the adult Sunday school class. And it didn't really bother me, but I didn't really have any fellowship with anybody my age most of the time. Well, I really kind of came to like this place, though. And I took it pretty hard when Rex died. And I really wasn't sure that the place was going to stay together. But I was really impressed that it did because I really thought that there were a fair number of people here that actually loved Jesus too. Maybe this really was Jesus' community church. Um, I was here when Kelly came, one of the few in the, in the group here still. Um, another very key moment in my life uh, was the passing of the one grandparent I did know, my mom's mother. Um, she lived to be 91, I believe. Didn't destroy me or anything, but it just, actually, when we were at her funeral, my father had already been diagnosed with cancer at that point. He was going to start chemotherapy as soon as we got home. And within a year and a half, he was dead. So I lost two adults in my life uh, within... Uh, maybe a little over two calendar years and it didn't destroy me but it did make me realize that this is real because your day will come too you'll get that diagnosis someday too I was 25 when my father died and I wasn't questioning my salvation um, I'm not totally sure where Kelly actually stands on vacation Bible school conversions because most of the time he seemed to not accept them. But one of his heroes, James Dobson, claims to have been saved at three. Um, I understand why people are skeptical. Because I guess I was too that very first day. That's why I didn't go forward. Because I was judging these other kids going, hmm, I don't know. You know, I spent a whole week with you. <laughs> but I had a period in my life where I knew I wanted to get serious with God. So I, at the least, I reconfirmed my free will desire to be saved and my need to be saved. And I went through a very substantial growth period pretty late. I was 25 at that point. But... Um, I grew a lot in the Lord for about five, six, seven years. Um, probably if you came to this church in the early 2000s, you're kind of wondering why I'm here and why I'm in some of the positions I'm in. Well, if you had judged me then, you'd have seen an angry guy, but if you knew me back then, that's why. Those were the growth periods in my life that that I think Kelly and the leadership responded to to ask me to participate in some things here. I got up in my 30s though and I, had, I started not liking my life very much. I was leasing a lot of land, farming it, and started doing that when I was 17. All that was falling apart. I was still single, unhappy with that. My sister was back living with me. She got a divorce, you know, in my home. I was unhappy with that. 
I was uh, going down the road of being an angry man. And I, I didn't think Kelly really wanted me here. Um, kind of didn't seem like I fit in with the church anymore, but didn't know how to leave. So I would say for several years I kind of had one foot in and one foot out of the church here. Uh, Kelly and I never fought for stuff, you know. That's one thing I just didn't want to do because that's pretty much the role model that I've seen growing up and I just refused to do that. We also left a lot on the table of what our relationship could have been though. Because uh, we're very different. I couldn't relate to a grown man that gets up at 11 o'clock, you know. <laughs> 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 Um, but there was definitely some anger there and frustration. Let's call it frustration. And frustrated people eventually get mad if they be unfortunate. I think it was probably 2009 and I had just a dread of 2010. And I thought, you know, you're so sinful and you're so stupid, there's no way God's talking to you. The, uh, I watched the news too, but the economy <clears throat> hadn't hit me yet in 2009. I was still working full time. I worked for a general contractor. We were still building houses. And so I thought, well, either you just, this is ridiculous or something's actually going to happen. So I started to kind of prepare myself for 2010 and, uh, you know, things did happen. Um, that was, well, we made it all the way to June and nothing happened, which just reaffirmed my feelings that I was just stupid. And halfway through the year, nothing took place. And, uh, well, then Kelly called me and I knew something was up because that just didn't happen anymore. Well, that was where he shared with me what he thought the Lord was doing in his life. Now, again, I wasn't destroyed, but that was a very big moment for me. Mostly it's for him and his family. But that, I knew instantly, sitting down there at Romeo's Cafe, that you can't have one foot in, one foot out. Either you're putting both out or you're getting both back in. And... Uh, I decided, you know, to put both back in. I decided to stay here. Um, I'm not sure where Kelly's at with the Lord. You know, I think he needs to change a lot too. But we had a lot of good times here with him though too. I don't want to make it sound like I don't like the guy. But um, in my preparations for 2010, I was reading, I decided to start reading the Proverbs. And in Proverbs 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth. And in the translation that I like to read in the morning, the New King James, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions. I'm aware that there's a Proverbs 2 and the Proverbs 3 goes on. You know, I, because there's always going to be one of those in the crowd that says, well, that's great, what about that verse? I try to read a proverb every morning before I go to work, and usually by 9 o'clock I'm kicking myself because I can't remember what I read. <laughs> that one got me. And it stayed with me since late 2009. And what it told me is God gives a rip that I'm down here. And if I will offer myself to Him, you will use me. I also, um, you know, just, all I'm going to say is I got my feelings hurt in 2010. And um, that's just the way life goes. I know most of you have those stories. Most of you do it a lot younger. I waited until I was 42 to do that. You're not very flexible at 42. <laughs> um, but there is a person out there that you know I pray for because I'm not sure where she's truly at with the Lord. 
but the reason that I believe what happened in the bedroom of the farmhouse back in the 70s is because when those kind of moments happen in your life, you tug against your anchor sometimes. And I know that my anchor is Jesus. And, uh, you know, I feel I probably owe the church a bit of an apology because I hit a five, six year run there where I wasn't being much of a deacon. Um, I had seen some elders and deacons leave and they and Kelly were willing to stand up here and politically correct, explain why they were leaving and I was too stubborn to do that. If Kelly wanted me to go or if I decided to leave, we were going to stand up here and tell the truth. And I think neither one of us really wanted to. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I don't know how Kelly honestly feels about me, but I know that it has been wonderful to just give yourself to the church and to the Lord and to be received. And I think that's, it, it may be just playing to our ego, but that's kind of what adult men want a little bit. They want to think that there's a reason why I should bother to do something. And um, once I realized that God would honor you if you gave himself to him, it really changed a lot of things for me. Sadly, Kelly was preparing to leave by that point. We actually had some pretty good meetings and talks and stuff toward the end there. But, you know, he was leaving. So, um, that's a lesson for all of us. You know, when, when you have somebody in your church family, don't waste that opportunity to have that relationship. I want to share one other thing that I see as a mistake that I've made but maybe some of you will benefit from it. Like a lot of people of my generation, I carried a King James Bible. And I was a kid who was getting special help in school. Wasn't retarded, but I went to a main class and then went over to get extra help. And the teacher that was doing the extra help busted me one day. I was nine years old. I was in the third grade, and I didn't know how to tell time. And she obviously had figured that out and set me up and, you know, and, and so we had to deal with it. So the, the kid that's nine, who can't tell time yet, has got a King James Bible. And unlike many of you who memorized many things in King James, I did not. I decided God's Word was way too hard. I'm not going to get this. So I went through life with a reverence for God's Word, but not a love for it. I received a New International Version in 1979. I still have it, and I know it was 1979 because Mom and Dad wrote that in there. But I would already formed the opinion that there's chunks of this you're just not going to get. So it didn't matter what translation it was in. But also, in 2010, was when I realized that you can't do this anymore. You just can't hide from the parts that you think you're too stupid to get. And God has opened up to me just a new relationship with His Word. Uh, he hasn't changed my intellect. I think I'm going to be required to deal with that. But His Word is sweet to me now. I carry one in my, in my pickup because... You know, I eat half my lunch on my break, and that gives me 17 minutes to read his word on my lunch break. And I, I just, I'm trying to soak it up now. I love it. I love to see what he has to say. Um, but I just want to encourage you guys, you know, to not make that mistake of just seeing it as a, a novel that God gave us. I... I really kind of, in a lot of ways, had a beef with God. Because I also wanted to know what love was. 
I think it was Foreigner that did that song, though. <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> uh, and, you know, I've had a problem with God, though. Because you say you created us to have relationship with us, and here's a book. Read it. Now, don't take me wrong here, but you married people. When you know it's time to go hug your spouse, try the trick sometime. Here, honey, here's a book. Read it. <laughs> you know, there's a chunk of us that's not satisfied with that. Now, I don't think God's going to strike me dead for saying that, because I think that part of us that's not satisfied with reading the book is what drives us on to read more of the book and study the book. <clears throat> Part of it is I don't like to read either. You know, Glenn here sees movies when he reads. Reading to me is like a journey with two sore feet. <laughs> if you trust that the destination is worth it, you'll stubbornly do it, but you don't really enjoy it as you're doing it. Um, but don't, you know, don't make that mistake. Um, honoring God's word kept me out of a lot of things that a lot of people have hanging around their necks and I'm very grateful for that. But I have wasted a lot of my life not loving God the way I could have and should have. And um, yeah, I just want to say that I'm very thankful to be a part of this body. My opinions and feelings have changed tremendously. I've done about a 165 degree turn in the last three years. Um, it may just play to my ego, but I'm really thankful that some of the ideas that have come through me have been embraced. It's just amazing, really, to see that. So, I just... Uh, you know, I, I conclude my testimony there because that's where I'm at right now. Right now, I'm just in a really sweet spot. I've wasted a lot of time, a lot of years. I won't get them back. But um, I just, I just love Jesus. You know, and I, just, I trust in Him as my Lord and Savior. Thank you.
God has had me for six days, reading Psalm 119. <laughs> and piece by piece, just, just looking into it. And, and there's an amazing concept there that I don't think we really get. The writer, the writer has a passion because the revelation that they have is God's word, God's law. He has a passion for that, a zeal for that, that is sadly lacking in the church in America today. Um, you know, we have, you know, some between 70 and 95 percent of Christians in America today never read their Bible during the week. They never even pick it up to see what God is saying to them. Um, the, the remainder that is there that does pick it up, you know, they read their little devotion, their, their daily bread thing, and they get their one verse a day, or maybe even a part of a verse, or you know, but there's a very small portion that actually pick it up and read it every day, and and you know I confess there are there are I don't like Jeremiah, <laughs> I don't like it. In the last two years, I'm on my fourth time reading Jeremiah, and I flip it over and I look and I go, oh. okay, God, here we go. Please show me something because I just I don't like it. Christy loves the Psalms. I like Proverbs. Right to the point. You do this, you're stupid. <laughs> I like that. Because I get that. Okay? I don't really get the, the emotion that a lot of times goes with uh, the writers of the songs. I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. Um, you know, I, I have in the last few years started to learn to identify what emotions are. And uh, I feel for you women. I really do, because I don't like to spend that much time thinking about that stuff. And, you know, Christy used to describe me as having two emotions. Angry, and not quite so angry. <laughs> and because my response to everything was, okay, or, okay, now that really made me mad. But God is starting to show me, and, and, and molded me, and changing me, and, and starting to show me that there are certain things that He has placed in each of us for a reason. And just because I'm uncomfortable dealing with those things doesn't have the value of those things. So we are in Colossians, and we're talking about how God has changed us and, and wants to mold us and shape us. And we're in Colossians chapter 3. And I was up quite a bit last night for a, a number of different reasons. And I, I spent a lot of time praying because I just didn't really have a peace about this message, which is funny because the message is about peace. <laughs> and, and, you know, I tend to be an impatient person. Um, if we're going to work, let's do it now and get it done. You know, let's, let's just do it and get it done. And so when we talk about patience, you know, you guys are lucky. You only get it for an hour. Half hour to an hour. I gotta deal with it all week. I gotta look into God's word and hold it up in light, reflection of my life, and realize, dang it. Boy, I missed that one. I really gotta work on this one. Okay, here's an area of weakness. I don't find a whole lot of areas where I'm doing well. I find areas that I'm doing better. But I haven't found a whole lot of areas where I'm doing well. And so when we were talking about peace, um, we're in uh, verse 12. I'm going to read a, a section here. We're actually going to be in verse 15 today, but I'm going to start reading out of verse 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father. Now, we've been at this for a while. 
Because I think it's important. When God, you know, when, when we were in school, one of the things that they taught us is if a teacher repeats themselves, write it down because it's going to be on the test. Okay? There were a lot of times that I could write down my name because they would repeat my name, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn. <laughs> it was never on the test, except in the name part. But when God repeats himself, pay attention. Because it's significant, it's important, it's a value. And we see repeatedly throughout the New Testament, and even, even in places in the Old Testament, the character description of what God wants for his people. What does God expect his people to look like? Okay? And we're right in the middle of this. And he lays it out. And it's important that we really understand what our lives should look like being a Christian. Because if your life doesn't look like this, you have no right to proclaim yourself to be a Christian. Now it's like the, you know, all these people, oh, we're all children of God. No, we're not. <coughs> no, we're not. John chapter 1 makes it very clear. To them that believed, he gave the right to be the children of God. To them. Those that don't believe, you're not his children. You're his creation, yes, but you're not his children. So, if you have Christ living in you, this is the natural outgrowth of what you should start to look like. Now, keep in mind, some of us have little bits of fruit. Some of us have a lot of fruit. The point isn't to measure myself against you or you against me. It's to measure myself against where I've come from and the changes that he has wrought in me. If you really want to compare yourself to someone, let's go right to the perfect example and compare yourself to Jesus Christ. We all get an F there. I want to compare myself to someone who's not quite as far along as I am so I can feel better about myself. I'm still looking for that person. You find him, send him my way, please. Okay? So, we're looking at the character description of what a Christian is. Now, we know the... the story, you know, where the, he's the vine, where the branch is. You plug the vine into the branch and it gets life. And we're not like just a branch that bears one kind of fruit. We have all kinds of fruit that should be coming out of us. And today we're talking about verse 15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Peace. What, what is peace? What, what does that even mean? This word in the Greek is used 59 times in the New Testament. All 59 times it's translated peace. Okay? All 59 times. So there's not, this isn't like one of those words where it can mean either this or it can mean this. It just means this. That's it. Okay, so you can't really confuse the issue here. But what is peace? Well, why did the translators into the English put it into peace? Let's look at Merriam-Webster. Okay? Now, I love the old Webster. Because Webster was a believer. And when he defined words, he always did them in light of God. Merriam-Webster, today, not so much. They've, they've taken a lot of that out of it. But, but here's what Webster has to say about it. A state of tranquility or quiet. As a freedom from civil disturbance, a state of security, or order within a community provided for by law or custom. Two, freedom from disquieting or oppressive thoughts or emotions. Three, harmony in personal relations. Four, a state or period of mutual concord between governments, a pact or agreement to end hostilities between those who have been at war or in a state of enmity. Hmm. So, in looking at this, I want to try and understand what Paul is saying here. And when the translators across the board translate that word always, peace, why? Why did they choose this definition to apply to this? Why is it important to God that we be a people of peace. Now, 
Is God saying you can't serve in the armed forces? You have to be a conscientious objector? There's arguments for and against that. I've heard good arguments both ways. Quite honestly, I think that has to be between you and God. I think that might enter into the realm of personal sin. Okay? But why does he want each of us to be at peace? Now, I find it interesting, in the definitions that I just read, number three said harmony in personal relations. I thought that was really kind of cool because we're going to back up a verse. Last week we talked about love and what is love. And quite honestly, I don't care who sang it. It was just a good song to dance to when you're in high school. <laughs> and I, I, you, if you guys know anything about me, I don't remember those things. I don't remember lyrics. I make up my words as we go along. And Christy will look over me and say, what are you singing? Whatever that is on the radio. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm singing my version. Okay? So, we're going to back up a verse. He says, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So see, we have these list of character attributes that have come out. Compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with each other and forgiving each other. Putting up with each other, with the differences that we have. Putting up with the idiosyncrasies. And then he says, and above this, put on the love. There's an active verb here. Something we have to do. Okay? But then he goes on, and he says this binds everything together in perfect harmony. And I think this is significant. Because all of these descriptions are descriptions of who God is. And what God is. This is what the vine has in it. And when you're plugged into the vine, this should be what flows through you. Okay? And I have homework for you. Ooh, homework. You can't give homework. You're a pastor, not a teacher. Today I'm going to be a teacher. You have homework. One of the core tenets of our theology, one of our core beliefs of Jesus Community Church, is we believe in a triune God. We believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I want you to prove to me from Scripture that theology. I want you to be prepared. When somebody comes to you and says, how can you believe in a three-headed God? I want you to be able to defend the faith. Because, see, this is significant. I know why I believe it. I can point out the Scriptures that I believe clearly lay out that there is one God in three parts. But I need to make sure you know it. It's significant because binding everything together in harmony, God is love. God is love. Last week I gave you scriptures where I just, hey, God is love. Agape. Unconditional. Not based on anything you've done, but based on who He is. Okay? But if God is existing in three parts... And he, being all three, is love. And they work in perfect harmony. What's harmony? Well, if you stand in front of me in church during the song service, that's what I'm trying to do. Not as well as my wife or my daughter. What is harmony? And again, Miriam Webster. He says, the combo take combination of simultaneous musical notes in a chord. The structure of music with respect to the composition and progression of chords, the science of structure relation and progression of chords, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, pleasing or congruent arrangements of parts. Correspondence, a chord. Internal calm, tranquility. An interweaving of different accounts into a single narrative. Did you get that? I love that. An interweaving of different accounts into a single narrative. That's us. That is you and I. That is the church. Harmony. Every one of us has a story. Every one of us has a story. And God is taking all of those stories and he's weaving them 
into one. His. And if that doesn't excite you, we need to knock on your head a little bit. Because only God can do this. One narrative. What is the narrative? The salvation that God has for a people that have despised Him. That have offended Him. That have willingly chosen other things. The entire fulcrum of history balances on the cross. And the entire destination of eternity comes as a result of that cross. Harmony. He's taking all of us together and blending us together in a beautiful symphony that brings glory to Him. That's the narrative. That it brings Him glory. Why is it important for us to, to live in harmony, to live in peace? Because we are the only reflection of Christ that this world sees. Christians, you know, that insulting term that came out of Antioch, you know, oh, you're the little Christ people. Yeah, that we embrace. Yeah, we're the little Christ people because he's the one that lives in us. He's the one that has given us life. He has birthed in us a life that they don't have. And he brings us together as his body. So why do we have to live in harmony? Do we have to agree on everything? No. I don't care what team you root for. I really don't. Unless you root for the Vancouver Canucks. Okay, then I care a little bit. Okay. We can have disagreements. We can even have disagreements on some of the things in here. No, we can't. We all have to believe the same. No, we have to believe in the same God. There are... Uh, St. Augustine said, you know, in the essentials we have to have unity. We have to determine what the essentials are and we have to agree on those things. In the non-essentials, liberty, freedom. Okay? And I always go back to the example. The second coming of Jesus, the rapture. Is it pre-trib, is it mid-trib, is it post-trib? Ultimately, this should never be a cause for division among us. Really? Because none of us knows exactly when he's coming. I look at scriptures and I determine what I believe scripture to say. I have heard sound, well-reasoned arguments for all three. For all three, believe it or not. I disagree with one of them just out of hand because I can't see that in scripture, but I've heard reasoned arguments for it. But really, if we can't celebrate together, that we can't worship the fact that he is coming again, and that he is coming to take his own unto himself? Really, isn't that the important part? That there is a coming? Isn't that the essential part? That he's coming back to claim his own? That's what he said. If you don't believe that, where is your hope? Where is your hope? So, the non-essentials, we have freedom. But in all things, we move in love. Okay? Peace. Jesus says, my peace I give to you. And one of the, the, the clearest examples of his peace that, that really astounds me, and I, I didn't really even pick up on it until just a short time ago. Jesus is in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. Okay? And he's laying out before God, God, if it's possible, let's find another way. If it would be possible, let's do it some other. But not my will, your will be done. To the point where he's sweating blood. Okay, and there's a medical term for that, and uh, I don't care what it is. It's in here, and I believe it, and that's okay. But there is a medical definition where under extreme duress, you can sweat blood. Okay, good, okay. Scientists have just come to the conclusion that God's right. <laughs> but he's under a lot of pressure. Now, three times he goes and goes back and God, if it's possible, take this cup away from me, but not as I will, as you will. Okay, this man's under a lot of stress. What happens when the crowd comes to arrest him? Is he under stress there? No, you don't see any stress. As a matter of fact, when Peter up sword and lops off an ear, no, 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 hey, what are you doing? 
I have to do this. This is, this is given to me to do. And he puts, picks the gear back up and sticks it on. And, and even in his horrible things that he's getting ready to go through, he's loving. He's loving. And he has a peace. He's standing before these guys that are hurling accusations at him. and they, they can't even agree on their lies. They can't even work together to lie convincingly. And what is he convicted of? Of telling the truth. Are you the chosen one? I am. You've heard enough. Let's kill him. Okay. He's at peace. Now, don't get me wrong. He went through a horrific beating. Scourging. Whipping. A horrific death. Okay. But at no point in there do you see him the way he was in the garden. Now, do we have peace all times? Yeah, we should have peace all times. But you know when peace really presents itself the most often? When times are not good. When they're tough. When they're rough. When things are starting, that the waves are doing like this, and you know, all of us are like the disciples going, Oh Lord, save us! And he's sound asleep. No, he's not sound asleep. He just knows that they can't hurt him. Okay? So, why is it important for us to have peace? Because we reflect to the people around us, to the community that has no light, no light. We reflect that light and light to them. Now, unfortunately, um, we do a really poor job of portraying this. We really do. Um, I, I heard an account this week that really, really hurt my heart uh, of a well-known Christian that just blasted a group of Christians and, and even went so far as to say they're not Christians. And that, that really distresses me because um, everybody's weird. Everybody's weird. You guys believe some things that I go, okay. And I'm sure I believe things that you guys go, whoa. Okay. But it's, it's the one that we believe in that unites us, right? And we do such a horrible job of portraying that to the world around us. Um, Matthew's story about you know, growing up in church. Um, I have a very similar story, growing up in a church and, and people's egos got involved and the church split and, and it was horrible because people couldn't sit down and acknowledge that they could be different without being wrong. Okay? That just because it's different doesn't necessarily mean it's sin. Okay? I have a lot of Respect for those people that don't use music on the stage or in their worship. Those people can sing. And they're, they're worshiping God. I love the instruments up on the stage. But I don't stand in condemnation of them because they don't. Peace. How do we get it? How do we get peace? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> because remember, my belief is that God never presents us with a problem in His Word, but that He presents us with a solution. Always there's a solution. Okay? Flip over to Philippians. We just went over this a couple weeks ago. I'm surprised you guys didn't answer me. <laughs> All right, here we go. This is how it works, okay? Now we're plugged into the vine. We have it flowing through us. A lot of times we put stuff in the way. We allow stuff to block God's ability to maneuver us and mold us and shape us. And here's, here's where we're at, Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Actually, it's kind of funny because this comes right on the heels of verse 2 where he talks to two women in the church and he says, hey, I, I want you guys to get along. Mm -hmm. He's addressing the peace issue in the church. But in verse 4 he says, rejoice in the Lord always. How often are we supposed to do it? Always. always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, here, here we go, make notes. The teacher's giving us, he's repeating himself. 
Rejoice. Again I will say, rejoice. Okay. See, our, our lifestyle right here, we're starting. Our lifestyle should be indicative of rejoicing in God. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Don't be a knothead. Like Charlie Brown says, don't be a blockhead. You know, let your reasonableness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. Now, here we go. Here is what I believe is the number one blocker to peace. Don't be anxious. About anything. So what should we be anxious about? Nothing. Nothing. We should not have anxiety in us. Do not be anxious about anything. There's the problem. Here's the solution. Now it's funny because part of the problem here is actually part of the solution to our, our original problem. How do we get peace? Well, first, don't be anxious. Okay, great. How do I not be anxious? I'm not being anxious. I'm not being anxious. I'm not being anxious. Not at all. I know that bill's coming due, but I'm not anxious about it at all. It's it's two minutes later, and it's still I don't have any way of being. I'm not being anxious. I'm not being anxious. No, that's not what he says. He says, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Hey, good month for that, isn't it? With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, is God oblivious of what we're going to pray for? No, God knows before we pray. He's already moving before we pray. God knows everything. He knows when you're going to pray and what you're going to pray. But He still wants us to pray. That's part of the relationship dynamic. I, I've got my wife pretty well figured out. I figure I know about 4% of her. <laughs> which is about 2% more than most of you men know your wives. <laughs> no, I'm, I, I'm kidding. I, but, you know, there are things that still surprise me about Christmas. There are things that She'll say, and I'll just go, who are you and what have you done with my wife? <laughs> because I don't know her that well. How do I get to know her? We continue to talk. We continue to dialogue. We continue to have relationship. And things are spoken. Okay? A lot of times what causes problems for us is assumption. Hey, where'd that thing go that I really like? Oh, I didn't really like it. I put it away. You, you never even looked at it in six years. Well, I look at it every day. Just I, I sit at my chair and I look at it because I like it. Oh, well, I never saw that. So I threw out, be back in a minute. I gotta go to the trash can. <laughs> God wants us to pray. He wants us to have relationship with Him. He wants relationship with us. Part of that is mutual, okay? How do you build relationship with someone that knows everything? I have a friend that knows everything. <laughs> oh, Lord. That's, I know God put him in my life so I can practice patience. But he, he says some of the most asinine things sometimes. And he knows something about everything. And if you know a little bit more than him, he'll BS his way through it so it looks like he knows more. And you just sit there going... But God really does know everything. And He still wants us to talk to Him, to share with Him, to, to lay it out before Him. He knows the problems that you're going through, He knows what you're going to ask, and He tells you, do it anyway. Do it anyway. You know what I found is the best way to do it? Out loud. Praying out loud. Sometimes it's really humbling when you pray out loud because you hear your, what you're asking. And you go, <laughs> never mind. I just realized how stupid that sounded. So, God, your will be done. And forgive me for that stupidity. But there are other times where I don't know why. We know Jesus prayed out loud. How do you think so many of them got written down in here? He was praying out loud. 
But there is just something uniquely different about praying out loud. So we, we bring these prayers, these supplications before Him with thanksgiving. What if the answer is no? Are you still thankful? You betcha. Why? Because God's got something better planned. He's got something better for you than what you're asking for. Do you believe that? you got to believe that. That's the only reason he's going to tell you no, because God's plans for you are good plans. Every good and perfect gift comes from him. Every single one of them. So when he says no, it's because he's got something better for you. And the better might just be that you didn't get that. Because you might have used it foolishly. That's what James tells us. You know, why don't you have what you ask for? Because you're asking with wrong motives. That you may spend it on yourself. So with thanksgiving, thank you God. Now here we go. Let your requests be made known to him. And. My favorite word. In the Greek, kahi. And, because it puts the solution with the problem. Okay, so we, we, he's given us, you're, you're facing difficulty. Here's what you need to do. Live a life of rejoicing. Bring your prayers and requests to him with thanksgiving. Give them to him. And. That's, it doesn't just end there. If it ended there, it would still be a worthy endeavor. But God doesn't end it there. He follows it up with something. He follows it with a promise. And the peace of God, peace, peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We have a, a really good example of this when uh, Mackenzie had to have a heart surgery. Um, you know, we were in Houston, and she, we'd known since shortly after she was born that eventually she was going to have to have open heart surgery. And that's, that's a really hard thing for parents to hear when they're, they're like, newborn. You know, like, with just in a few months of being born, yeah, she's got a heart condition, you're going to have to do surgery. And we were in Houston, and she was, uh, well, she was about five years old, six years old? Four four years old, and, and the doctor said, yeah, we're going to have to do the surgery now. Christy and I were not prepared. We were not prepared. Now, I don't know if the doctor was just jumping the gun, or if God heard our desperation and responded. But we got a second opinion from a, a pediatric cardiologist, and they said, no, I, I don't think she needs the surgery right now. I think she needs to wait. And she waited for seven years, eight years, eight years, eight years. And then the pediatric cardiologist, we were up here, we are actually in this church. And he said, it's time. We need to do the surgery right now. She's strong enough right now that she can stand the surgery and it's, we can see that it's starting to be debilitating to her health. Let's do it right now. God was so gracious to us in that time. God was so gracious. Because we're sitting in the waiting room for them to come and take my daughter back and I can't go with them. And God's grace was on us and His peace was with us. And I'll tell you one of the most humbling things in my life that I've ever experienced is when we talked with Mackenzie about this procedure, she shrugged her shoulders and she said, what could go wrong? She said, the worst that could happen is I could go to sleep and wake up in heaven. Man, that's hungry. What a surety. What peace. Well, obviously, she didn't wake up in heaven, because there she sits. <laughs> but God's peace, he knew when the time was ready. He knew when he had worked in us enough that we could handle it. He knew that when we were in Houston, I was nowhere near close enough to God that I could trust him, that I could rely on him, that I could lean on him. And he waited. And he gave us eight years to grow in him, to draw close to him, to be prepared. So when that time came, he could minister to us and we could receive it. 
I can't explain it. I, I can't explain it. Um, you know, when we were waiting for the doctor to come out and tell us how the surgery went, there was a family that was in the room, the private room, just across from us, and they, they were just, they were screaming. They, I don't know if things were going bad or things were going, I don't know, but for a long period of time, the father was just a basket case. And I thought that would have been me eight years ago. I would not have been able to do this. Peace. Now, there's one other thing that I want to share with you. Okay. Paul also writes in another place. He says, in so much as it depends on you, be at peace with who? Amen. Everyone. 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 See, if it's you that's causing the problem, you got to stop. You have to live in peace. If they're causing the problem, we go back to this. We lift up our prayers to God. His peace will settle on us. As a matter of fact, you, I, I love the story when Jesus sends out the 72. He says, you go into a town, if they receive you, let your peace rest on that house. If they do not, let it return to you. See, there, there's no reason anywhere that the disciples wouldn't have peace. None. Because either they're giving it and it's shooting out from them and filling up the house, or it's all just settling on them. And that's the same with us. We have to be a people of peace. When people do stupid things, and people will do stupid things, brothers and sisters in Christ will do stupid things. I'm going to do stupid things. Let peace radiate out from you. You're tapped into the giver of all peace. You're tapped in. Let it radiate out from you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Being a people of peace. We thank you.